Okay. So, wonderful. Welcome. <coughs> All right. I think that we're about ready to start now. So, welcome and thank you very much for coming to the um, book talk today. I'm really so pleased to have Dr. Susanna Ho here to um, talk to us about how she's seeing her world through writing. And I really love the elegant typography, which you do, as opposed to the, um, the parentheses that we had, um, we, we had done. So um, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about Susanna. Um, Susanna grew up here in Hong Kong, but for senior high school and her undergraduate career, she spent in Canada. Um, she got her BA at the University of Manitoba, and she was an English lit major. Then she, she's very educated, then a master's in teaching English as a second language from City U, a PG certificate from, US, from Hong Kong U, and a PhD from Macro University in Sydney. So you still have, I think, five more universities in Hong Kong to get degrees from to get the whole set. Yeah, yeah I'm collecting those. <laughs> honorary. And, oh, honorary, that's a good way to do it, yeah. Um, today, she's, um, she, her first novel, Mother's Tongue, A Story of Forgiving and Forgetting, was published in 2013. Now, the library has a copy, and I read it over the Chinese New Year. It was wonderful. But I cannot show it to you today because somebody else recalled the book, mm -hmm. and I thought that it would be too cruel to make them wait for it. <laughs> but copies of the book are here available for sale, and um, she also has a very new book, um, who's that and who's dead end and that um, just came out this month so um, we're very and her illustrators here to um, to uh, maybe participate in um, Q&A later her illustrator Jill hi, hi. okay <laughs> so um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Susanna Hall when we were small we received a lot of advice whether we ask for it or not. Those who offer this advice are usually our parents and those who look after us. As we grew older, we received advice from our teachers, friends, and professionals. Some of the advice might conflict with each other, but most of the advice was similar. Two pieces of advice that I kept receiving when I was a, a kid was one, don't lie, and two, study. <laughs> study very hard. <laughs> Today I'm not going to talk about advice, I'm not going to give you advice, rather I'm going to share with you something about writing and some of my writing. The two pieces of advice that I talked about just now will come back in my talk later. Hello everyone, my name is Susanna Ho. I teach at the Center for Language Education and I thank Tori for such a generous introduction. And um, writing is something I do every day. I teach my students how to write, or write better, and I write myself. I think we all write every day. We write phone messages, emails. Whether we write fiction or non-fiction, we are all writers in a way, but we don't usually see it that way. When I ask my students um, what the purpose is of writing, I, they usually say writing is to inform, to persuade, and to express oneself. Not many of them would say writing is to entertain. Maybe they don't find writing entertaining. I agree that writing is primarily to persuade. To be more specific, Writing is a vehicle for me to get my message across. Now my title of the talk is Seeing My World Through Writing. Those who do not know me or who do not know me well enough might think that this is an egoistic way of approaching the topic. This is not my intention. I have no intention to focus on only my world. Rather, it is my modest view of seeing the world from, from where I am and who I am. And it is my wish that my world overlaps with yours. After all, we live in the same world. Now these are the two books I'm going to talk about in today's talk. As regards why I write, 
I suppose I want to ask questions, and quite many of them. And usually I make an attempt at answering these questions in my book, and I put my answers throughout the book, usually at the beginning of the book. Remember the two pieces of advice? The first one, don't lie. As I grew older, I started asking myself, what does it mean? What does don't lie mean? Can we tell white lies? Is it OK to lie with good intentions? Which is better, to tell a good lie or to tell the cold or the hurtful truth? So in real life, in some situations, it's actually quite difficult to tell what a lie is as opposed to what the truth is. Very often, the two blurs with each other. So I'm not saying that it's good to lie or I'm not trying to justify that lying is a noble act. But for me, I think there's a sense of truth in every lie. And likewise, people have an urge to lie even when they are telling the truth. As George Orwell says, in a time of deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. So I have nothing but respect for those who always try to defend the truth. Now the second piece of advice, study. What does study mean? As a kid, I think it's very simple. Study means attending classes, completing all your homework, taking exams, and try to attain a certain level. And once you attain a certain level, you go for another level. But as I grow older again, I think, oh, what does education actually mean? Does education always make an educated mind? And here, I'd like to refer to Immanuel Kant's um, <coughs> educational statements. He is famous for his philosophical ideas. And well, it's a set of notes, his educational statements, is a set of notes he made uh, on for the professorial courses on physical geography and pedagogics. And he passed his notes to um, a younger friend and the former pupil, Caulfield of uh, Rink, who organized the notes for him and published it in the year 1803, the year before he died. Well, Immanuel Kant realized that the set of notes he made are not exhaustive and might not be well formulated, but as an educator, as somebody who is concerned about education, I think it's still worth going back um, to his educational statements from time to time just to get some inspiration. And here I'd like to quote a few of his educational statements. Education is imperative for the development of mankind. Children must be educated to achieve not only the present level, but also a better future level of human race. Good education should be able to bring gradual improvement to the world. Education is an art which can only become perfect through the practice of many generations. And here in this book, Who's That and Who's That Then, you will see the history of education of any kind over a number of generations. And for me, I think education is for life. It's not confined to learning that happens, take place in the classroom, and it's not just learning that takes place in one dimension. We'll come back to this message later. As a writer, I think I'll be lying to you if I say I do creative writing every day. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's even possible for full-time writers. There are times when I need stimulation and inspiration. And inspiration can come in many forms. And it can come from within and from the outside. And inspiration for me um, are mainly come from two sources, from events, both personal events and events that happen in the world, and also books that I was reading at the time when I was writing. And I don't think a lot of writers, but very few writers would choose to ignore what's happening around them and just use um, well, focus on writing. I think it's better to embrace it. Writing is a very lengthy process, and it could take years before you complete a book. And for example, my first novel, Mother's Tongue, uh, a story of forget forgiving and forgetting, sorry. it took me six years to finish it. It was six years between the day I put my first sentence and the day when I held the physical book in hand. 
So it's a very lengthy process, and I cannot ignore what's happening around me. And the best thing to do is to embrace what's happening around you and use it as part of your writing. So one thing I embrace is actually a life-changing event. I said it's a life-changing event because this happened, what happened to my mother and it happened to my family, made me pick up my pen again. And because of what happened, I started writing or I started writing fiction again. In year 2006, my mother had brain surgery. And it was a very complicated surgery. It lasted for 14 hours, but she survived it. And at that moment, um, the doctor suggested that two options. The first option is um, conventional brain surgery, and the second option is a less intrusive garment knife radio surgery. In the photo you can see, here is a system used for garment knife uh, radio surgery. In the end, my mother chose, um, or we chose for her, um, a more intrusive conventional brain surgery. So chapter one seems really real to me. Okay, and, and also it's real to my family and those who witnessed my, my mother's brain surgery. But um, the biographical element stops there. Okay, and starting from chapter two onwards is, uh, is my imagination that starts working. And I'm not going to refer uh, the, this chapter to you. I'd like to fast forward to a year later when the woman in this book experienced a relapse. And I'm not sure how many of you read the book, and maybe not all of you read the book, so maybe I'll give you some background. And in the book, the woman, like my mother, had, a, had brain surgery, and she, she survived it. And uh, but when she re regained co consciousness, the first sentence she spoke in was not in Cantonese, which is a family language, that some, a language that um, every, everyone in the family been using for, for the whole, uh, her, her whole life. And instead, she started speaking in a dialect that nobody understood. So you can imagine how surprised the family members were. Luckily, this did not happen to my mother. Okay, so as I, I told you, it's, uh, the biographical element just not there. Um, I'm going to read to you a section um, a, a, a year later when she, was, uh, when she experienced a relapse and the doctor suggested a second operation. And, but before that, I'd like to show you two photos um, of an event that helped me, that inspired me of my writing. Do you remember this? And yeah, of course, I, I wasn't there and I didn't have first hand experience. But what I saw on television was enough to make me feel really sorry for the people in Fukushima in March 2011. As many as 300,000 people were evacuated. And so when the doctor suggested a second operation and the daughter, the narrator of um, this story, could not decide what to do and wonder what were we supposed to do in the matter of life and death? I needed time to think about things and I needed food to go along with it. Having a hearty breakfast wasn't such a bad idea. I usually had breakfast at home, and meat was almost never included. But now I needed time and food to have me think, and an elaborate breakfast, by my standard anyway, was necessary. I went to a small cafe near my home early one morning, alone. I wasn't able to deal with conversation yet. It was so early in the morning that there were not many customers. Those who came usually got their orders to go. So I had pretty much the whole place by myself. <coughs> this suited me well. Having ordered a full breakfast and a coffee, I sat down to read the front page of the paper. My brain needed some stimulation to get started. By the time I finished reading all the headlines and the main story about the radiation leak in Fukushima's nuclear plant, the waitress brought me my breakfast and coffee. I thanked her, and I really meant it. When such a disaster happened somewhere not far away, how could I not be thankful for everything? The more I thought about the tsunami victims and the plight they were in, 
the more convinced I was about the tri triviality of mom's health condition. A second operation did not mean the end of the world. There was still hope. There was still hope. And other than this event, travel is also a very good way to inspire me. I don't usually keep travel journals. Um, the few times that I made the attempt at doing so was a disaster. I wasn't self-disciplined enough to recall every single detail of my trip. Uh, but it's not to say that I don't use my travel experience at all. In June 2011, um, I visited the Museum of Nanjing Massacre. And what I saw there, I was really troubled by what I saw there, and so much so that I wanted to recreate what I saw in the form of a story. And I put it in one of the diary entries of my first novel. Um, those who read the book would know that one third of the book is written in the form of a diary. Whose diary is that? It's a mother's diary. She wrote in the diary for three years, from the year 1955, when she was 15 years old, to 1958, when she was 18. But today, I'm not, I've decided not to read this entry to you, because it's rather sad, and I don't think it's appropriate. Um, but just in case you want to read and you want to uh, draw the parallelism yourself, it's on page 249 onwards. It's a diary entry dated the 27th of July, 1955. So you can read it for yourself. Books also give me inspiration. It's a source of inspiration. And um, books help me think about matters in life. And during the time when I was writing Mother's Tongue, uh, in the year 2011, I was also, well, I was reading many books, and one of which is uh, Victor Hugo's Le Miserable. Um, as much as the book is about human suffering, inequality, and fight for justice, I think the book is also about youth and the joy of being young. Many people will remember Cosette, but not a lot about her mother, Fontaine, um, a working class woman who hopelessly falls in love with Cosette's biological father. And um, until maybe Anne Hathaway plays a role in the more recent musical, then people started looking up uh, to this character again. Um, there's one scene, I don't think it has been included in the, in the film, not even in the older version of the film. It's a country picnic scene of eight young people. Those you read in my recall, four young men and four young women. And I think Victor Hugo has done an excellent job at creating um, the spirits of the young people, and I want to recreate it in, in my book, in my writing as well. Um, but rather than including so many people, because um, I, sometimes I have problem remembering people's names, and so, and as you can tell, some of the, the names in my, well, some of the characters in my book do not have names. Um, so I, I make it into just a very small group, two young women and a man. And I'm going to read this uh, for you. It's, um, also in a diary entry, um, 200, page 243. Remember this is written as a diary entry. I'm so exhausted that I should go to bed now, but I really want to write out everything that happened today. It was such a wonderful day. It turned out to be a picnic of three. Zhang Li, Zhang Li is um, the good friend of the woman my neighbor brother and me. They came to my house to collect me at eight o'clock sharp. We then started off with two baskets of food and drink. When I saw how much Jiang Li prepared, I thought she must be crazy. I wonder how we would manage to eat so much food and didn't realize that the walk would create such a good appetite. For two hours, we hiked along a trail grown with daisies, ferns, weeds, and many other plants that I don't know the names for. There were, of course, creepers and willows that we needed to clear as we moved our way forward. My neighbor brother carried one of the baskets, the one loaded with drinks, and Zhang Li and I took care of the other one. After an hour of walking, we all felt very tired, and Zhang Li suggested taking a break. We were desperate for some shade and stopped near a tree. 
It was a surprisingly quiet and peaceful spot. It was a treat to have found such a shade on such a hot and sunny day. Having wiped off our sweat, we fed ourselves with our handkerchiefs. Quite old fashioned, isn't it? With the help of the breeze, we began to enjoy our outing. Then our neighbor brother awkwardly said something out of the blue. It's such a nice environment that I wouldn't mind being buried here. Don't you think so? Johnny reacted almost immediately. Don't say that, it's bad luck. I'd be so sad if you die. Let's not talk about that. Come, let's have some water before we start walking again. That's a good idea. I'm usually not superstitious. But to talk about death at such a happy moment was rather inappropriate. I quickly opened the basket and drinks with drinks, and instead of finding water there, I caught sight of something that looked like wine. Before I had time to phrase my question, Zhang Li was already holding one of the two bottles. We are going to have a lot of fun with this. See, I managed to take two bottles from the kitchen cupboard without being seen by anyone. Both my neighbor brother and I looked at her and said that we had never had alcohol before. She laughed and said that we would love it. A party is a party without any drinking. So the basket that my neighbor brother carried contained two bottles of wine and a bottle of water. No wonder it was so heavy. We walked for another hour before we arrived at an open field. It was very green there. It would be good to walk in the field for a while, but we certainly couldn't stay there for lunch. It was too hot and too exposed. Just when my neighbor brother and I were discussing what to do, Zhang Li led the way and took us to a small clearing shaded by a few big trees. Not only was it nice and cool, there was a stream nearby too. A perfect spot for our picnic. We began to set down our baskets. Then Zhang Li gave us another surprise. She took out a big tablecloth and laid it on the ground, saying that it would be where we could lie down for a nap after lunch. I would say that she is very thorough and has every single detail thought out. It wasn't quite lunchtime yet, but the walk made us feel so hungry that we couldn't wait any longer. Zhang Li cooked a few dishes for us, some deep fried fish, spare ribs, cucumber and vinegar, and lots of plain small buns. Although there were not too many choices, we had enough to call it a feast. Together with the wine, it was quite an elaborate picnic, something that I would never have imagined before. Talking about the wine, it turned out to be a very strong alcohol. Jamie said it was white wine and very popular in the north. I think I've seen my family drink something like it before but I've not paid any attention to it. Drinking from the small wine glasses that Zhang Li prepared, we downed one glass after another while enjoying the food without thinking much about getting drunk. The size of the wine glasses was small and deceptive. Very soon we lost count of how much we drank and before we realized it, the whole bottle was gone. I felt a bit tipsy. Not exactly drunk, but my neighbor brother's face turned very red. He looked as if he would explode. Among the three of us, Zhang Li seemed to be least effective. She suggested that my neighbor brother take a nap while we do the washing up in the street. So that's a very happy picnic scene uh, with two young women and a young man a rather innocent kind of relationship. But as we all know, when Victor Hugo spoke, um, the innocent relationship did not last long. And I won't say too much about my book yet. And, um, such a relationship, two young women and a man, is also um, given in Laoshe's novel, Rickshaw Boy. And this is uh, in the photo, I took it, the photo myself, and this is the old residence of Laoshe in uh, Beijing. And I also visited his residence in Qingda, where he spent three and a half years writing and finishing his book, Rickshaw Boy. Tori recommended this book to me. <laughs> I think over like one lunchtime, and 
uh, sometimes we bump into each other in the coffee shop, and whenever we do, we naturally talk about books. <laughs> and she said, oh, this, um, this one very good modern classic Chinese book, and have you read it? And I said, no, what is it? And she recommended it, and I read it, and, and it's really good. And it gives me a, a, what is a big source of inspiration for me. I'm not going to read um, the, well, the, the sections, because um, Rickshaw Boy is mentioned throughout the diary entries, and there are quite many of them, and I, I wouldn't want to just read all of them to you, but then um, just in case where um, the inspiration, you wonder where the inspiration comes from, it's actually come from the, um, the book. Um, I wouldn't talk too much about the book, and um, those who read the book would know that it's, um, it's a story that happens in old Beijing in 1920s, 1930s. And of course, it's about uh, Xiaozi, the um, rickshaw driver. Um, he's young, strong, and determined to earn a fortune. And in his mind, he thinks that as long as he owned his own rickshaw, he would be able to get rich. And at one point of his life, he did get um, a rickshaw himself. He doesn't have to rent. And, but then, um, there's a, then his fortune reverse. So the lesson I can draw from this book is the reversal of fortunes. Just when you think that your life is at a low point, something good might come up. Or, just when we are too complacent, something unfortunate might happen. We just have to accept that life is ever changing. Now, life is ever changing. Um, in year 2014, in September, um, there's one, um, one, one night I was watching news on television, and it is a press conference. There were a group of officials from Education Bureau. They were bombarded with questions from angry parents who were not happy that classes were canceled. I wasn't there in the press conference. Of course, I, I only watch it as, on television. If I had been there, I would have said this to the angry parents. I would have told them that, let's not forget that education is for life. Those who are concerned about their children's education should also be concerned with how they are to be educated. Confining the learning to that of a classroom tends to create mass produced minds that are narrow and unimaginative. But I wasn't there. I wasn't at the press conference. But I was there. On the 1st of October 2014, I went to Emirati. And I wanted to go there and see for myself what it was like. And I must say that I was very impressed with what I saw. It was orderly. And there were a lot of people. It was very crowded. There were many um, young people. But there was no chaos. And I also remember watching and hearing a lot from the foreign media, and they had nothing but praise for the young people. In the process of demanding democracy, I think the young people still continue with the study. And some of them were doing their homework and studying there, and um, so other people were organized, where they organized themselves, and they even organized themselves down to the very single detail by separating the rubbish for recycling. So I, I was very impressed. I'm going to read um, a section from my second novel, Who Said and Who Said Unto You? But it's not exactly um, what, a recreation of this event. When you listen to me, perhaps uh, you can see whether you can identify any elements of uh, the umbrella movement um, in this reading. Um, there are eight chapters in this book. I'm going to read from chapter six. Each of the chapters focuses on the main end character. Um, but chapter six is the only one that does not focus on any end. It's a quite resurface. People will want to overthrow the leader. And the name of the leader is called Confucian. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read this to you now. Pressured with the possibility of losing her power, Confucian fought her last battle, which became so famous 
that was, it was given her name in the history of mankind. It was probably the only civil unrest that was done in the most civil way and without a single drop of blood being shed. It was also famous for another reason, which was officially recorded. For a long time, the rumor went that the new migrants were planning to overthrow Confucian by simply marching into her office. To stop that from happening, Confucian decided that her only hope was to consolidate her power by having all her trusted subordinates work around her. That's how Sapa, Donna, Dice, and Agent came to work in her office for almost a season. Not only did they work, eat, and sleep in the same office, they became so used to each other that they finally chose not to step out of the office. Living and working together showed solidarity and their united power. They figured that they would win as long as they stayed together. To connect to the rest of the colony, they relied on a group of foot soldiers whose main task was to deliver food and news. In a way, they had created a small colony within a bigger one. For almost a season, they lived in that bubble world without direct contact to the outside. There were days without news of attack, when Confucian and her protectors relaxed a little. Any mention of mass gatherings by the messengers made them extremely nervous. During those times, they were unable to come up with a single work policy. If you are holding a book like I do now, you will see this illustration. My illustrator, Jill, will join me in the Q&A session later. They had been living in an illusory state of peace for a few days when a messenger knocked at the door of Confucian's office one morning and announced, they're coming, they're getting close. What are you talking about, asked Dice. He went to answer the door. You better prepare yourself, said the messenger. They're coming in this direction. Who are you talking about, asked Agent this time. And how many are there? Countless, said the messenger. I lost count at 447. What are you going to do now, asked Dice. Shut up, ordered Donna. Everyone suddenly seemed confused about what to do. They had never discussed defense tactics. When the mob finally arrived at the door, they saw how big the crowd was. If 500 ants were said to have helped the author of this history book to escape his death sentence in the last chapter, there had to be more than 5,000 marching towards the office, ready to fight the battle of confusion. A big bang came at the door. What shall we do now? Asked Sapa. Shall we fight? No said Confucian. Let's open the door. Are you sure? Said, asked Donna. Yes, I'm very sure. For the first time, Confucian did not create any work puns. Then came a second bang before Dice gingerly opened the door again. To her surprise, the ant standing in front of her was only half a size. Dice became less afraid and asked, what do you want? Our representatives want to see Confucian, answered the small size and in a powerful voice. Nobody can see Confucian without making an appointment, said Dice. Our representatives don't need an appointment to see Confucian. Everybody needs an appointment to see Confucian, said Dice. No, don't be silly. If your representatives want to see Confucian, you must first make an appointment. But we are not asking for a meeting said the small size ant. So what are you asking for? Asked Dice. A roar! Roared the small size ant. Those who did not see the ant, but only heard his voice, would have mistaken it for a loud thunder. In Confucian's mind, she took it as the last few notes of her grand finale. So that's the civil unrest it was done in the most civilized way without a single drop of blood being shed. Another book that I was reading at the time when I was writing the book was <coughs> of Ashley McKee's 100 Years of Solitude. And this is a very complex book uh, that stretches across five generations uh, of a family started by Hussein and Ursula. And 
It's very complex in many ways because of its uncertainties in time, place, and even characters because some of the characters um, share the same name or very similar name. I'm not going to say too much about this book. And one thing that is special about this book is the title, 100 Years of Solitude. Who's solitude and why solitude? Um, as a writer, I think that Lakeith is secretly hoping that he's allowed to write in solitude in his study. In the book, it's called his workshop. Remember, Confucian was overthrown in the book, and this is what's going to happen to him. Confucian was not convinced that her days were over. She thought it only logical that her goodwill would be rewarded with a reciprocal gesture. Hoping that her power would be restored, she chose to stay in the colony among the broken machines for the rest of her life. She refused to leave the machines in a firm belief that they would work again one day. She also believed that she would become the queen, not just the leader of the colony, when the machines started working again. Every day, a good amount of food was delivered to her through a door sleeps. She refused to show her face again. She continued to live in their workshop for a few seasons in solitude, until one day when neither ants nor machines moved. Only when her food had not been collected for days did it occur to the new leaders that something was wrong. When the door of the workshop finally opened, it was said that Confucian had become part of the machines that were used to mass produce test tube baby ants. Sad, isn't it? So that's the reading. And so far I've been talking about events, uh, both personal events and events that happen in the world that inspire me and also books that inspire me. And I suppose these are the issues I want to explore in my book and see how many of you can identify in this simple Please do not be shy. How many do you, what do you Time. see? Time, good, yes. Sorry? The brain, yes, brain surgery, yes. Peace. And peace, yes, that's well peace, very good, yeah. And nature, maybe trees. And this is a symbol I found on the internet with compliments of the company called Time Peace. They make watches and they put this symbol on um, the face of the watches. I think it's a very clever design. And I wrote to them, and um, they have kindly let me use the symbol in my book talk. Um, so I thank them for their ge generosity. Um, yes, these are the issues I really want to explore in my book, um, time. Time is a very interesting notion. Sometimes you feel time goes very fast, and sometimes you feel that time goes very slowly. If you think um, the last 30 minutes or so passes very quickly, I take it as a good sign. <laughs> um, and also, another well, reason why I think time is an interesting notion is it's not always proportional. Victor Hugo spent 14 <coughs> years writing his book, Les Miserables, but certainly it won't take us 14 years to read it. It might take me 14 years to study and understand his work, but it certainly doesn't take me 14 years to read it. But it's not to say that we won't remember it. A piece of work like this is timeless. So another issue I really want to explore, and I did, but we didn't have time to talk about it in today's talk. I'm not sure if you can see what the issue is. Maybe it's more obvious in this one. You got it right, fairness. And this is something that I, I also explore in my book, uh, what is being fair, what is not fair. And, um, so, it, but we have, have no time to talk about it in today's talk. So you have a glimpse of the world that I try to portray in my two books. And I just hope that you can identify some of the issues that also matter to you. Our world is full of kindness and cruelty, certainties and unknowns, hope and hopelessness, wisdoms and absurdities. 
I think one way to deal with this ever-changing world is embrace it. Embrace your life and make the most of what happen, whatever happens to you. Thank you. Now, um, Susanna left plenty of time for Q&A, so um, I have a microphone here, and we have an extra one here. So please, um, if you have comments or questions, I'd very much um, like to share the mic. Um, you can also um, grab some more sandwiches if you want. Present. Okay, well, wow, I, um, I'll start off with a comment. I, I didn't know that I was influential. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm glad because um, I, I was very interested in how you, um, in, in the novel, what, um, in, the, um, in the Mother's Tongue novel, the main character is, um, in her diary, she talks about reworking Rickshaw Boy as a, um, a fiction in a sort of school magazine yeah, newspaper. School magazine. And so I was wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about how your, it's sort of writing through several mirrors or lenses. You're writing about somebody else's book, writing, adapting, and things of that nature. Um, I think it just comes naturally because when you are so involved in your writing and you just want to, you, you think about it. And I think about it a lot when I'm, well, as Agatha Christie said uh, once, uh, her inspiration comes when she is doing the dishes. <laughs> so um, I think sometimes I got my inspiration when I'm in my shower mm -hmm. and uh, when I'm working out in the gym or when I'm swimming. Oh. Yeah, so um, so I, I think at that time I was reading Rachel Boy and it just came naturally that, oh, uh, wouldn't it be nice? Because I, I was reading, it was run ambitious of me. I, I read the Chinese version. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And um, it, w it was difficult for me. Mm -hmm. So I read very slowly. And because of the slow speed, actually it's good, because then I take in the text and I said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I recreate some of the things I, I read? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how the idea came up. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, any other comments? Oh. <coughs> I, I okay, um, how about you, you, and then you? <laughs> Hi there. Um, I was wondering that since you're from Hong Kong and mm -hmm. studied in, in Canada, uh, you probably speak both Cantonese and English fluently. Yes. So. Um, if writing is a way of seeing the world, the, do you see the world differently if you write in English as opposed to if you write in Cantonese? Uh, or are there subjects that you can't write about in one language but you can in another? I think you asked a very good question because um, I think I stopped writing in Chinese for many years. Actually, I stopped reading Chinese for many years and it's only recently I, I started trying to write in Chinese again. And um, I would have to, I, I wouldn't be able to write a, a, a novel in Chinese. Uh, but I could write phrases, um, whether you call it poetry or not, but phrases in Chinese. Um, I think that they are, I see my world more through English. And, but then um, recently I watched a documentary of a Chinese writer Yashen. I'm not sure if uh, people watch this documentary. And, well, because the, the, the film was, um, there are several languages used in, in the film in English, uh, Mandarin, and uh, a, a little bit um, Taiyu, that's the, the Mandarin, uh, well, the dialect in, in Taiwan. And then I started writing uh, Chinese again. I think I, I need more exposure. Yeah, I certainly see um, different worlds. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the sharing, and you're a very good storyteller. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask, um, you said that you write your first novel for six years. Yes. How do you commit yourself to keep writing the same novel? I mean, when you got a new inspiration, you have, like suddenly you want to write a another like new book, new story. So how do you commit to one storyline? 
I know what you're talking about. Actually, uh, when I thought of writing this, um, no, I, I think I had several manuscripts started. Yeah. And um, even now, I have two in my pipeline, and I'm not sure if I would finish them. Um, but yes, at a certain point, you will have to tell yourself uh, what do you want to focus in the next two or three years. And um, this is quite clear to me because, as I said earlier in my talk, chapter one seems really real to me. So um, I really want to finish this um, for my family, for myself. Um, but then this one, I had actually started the manuscript a long time ago, but it, was, uh, it wasn't until year 2014 I started really, really uh, working on it. And then at that time, I still had two other manuscripts um, started, and I have one um, over 20,000 words, and so I, I think naturally I would continue with that. But then um, I talked to several friends, and they said, oh, maybe you should focus on this one. This one is on education, right? So I said, yeah. Um, so I took that advice, and I started really working on this one, and I just left the other two projects aside. Your turn, and then we still have more time, so Very, very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. I have not read either book, and so this may uh, be a question from uh, ignorance in that respect. No, no, no. But uh, you've obviously been influenced by philosophers, by philosophy, and politics even. I would be interested in your saying a few words about your own personal philosophy. I mean, where do you come down on these? on these polar opposites of, uh, of uh, education and ignorance of uh, advancement and, uh, uh, you know, s standing still. I, are you basically optimistic? Do you believe the world's improving? Or any, anything that you might like to comment on that, in that vein? I think the world is improving in many ways. Um, for example, technology and um, the way people communicate with each other. But on the other hand, there are things that we are actually lagging behind or, or not moving forward. And um, I mean, yeah, you know the reason, very many writers would um, explain why they write. And I suppose one of the reasons why I write is I can't change the world. I'm not a politician, and um, but I can change whatever I can change. For example, in the classroom, or I can change whatever I can change by putting my ideas in um, my writing. So, um, in a more indirect or, or in a more subtle, or some people would say in a more passive way of changing the world. But I, I think um, the world is getting, it should be getting better. But I think we could have done a lot better than what we have now. If you can agree, we could do better. <laughs> but yeah, that makes me think of um, some quote about how poets are the invisible legislators of the world. Yeah. Trying to yeah. That one. Okay, another question over here. And I think after this one, we can maybe have two more. Oh, you, by the way, you can ask any questions about the illustrations. Uh, yeah, and she's more flexible. She can answer questions in uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. <laughs> Just a, a, a simple question. Um, why choose Anne as the characters as the characters in your book? Um, oh. You mentioned about George Orwell, and yes. it, I mean, Anne Wilfram quickly just came into my mind. Mm. Mm. Um, I did actually do any research about animals uh, when I started my book, but when I was a kid, uh, I was quite a cruel kid. So. <laughs> um, and when I had nothing to do, um, I captured uh, some ants, <laughs> and in the way I tortured them, and the way I tortured them was, because um, I, I, it was so boring, long summer holiday, I had nothing to do, unlike what you have now, and you have, uh, your, your summer is occupied with a lot of work. Um, so I captured the ants, and, uh, um, and I put them in, um, not in a glass bottle, not, not what is mentioned here. And um, I, I give them a timetable. So really, um, yeah, you should be doing this. And actually, I think that's a projection, and that's what I'm supposed to do. 
And um, I even used a tweezer to, you know, take the ants from um, the bottle and I put them in a, in a coaster, uh, which happens to be a gap there, and I said, okay, now you have to run in the race. So, <laughs> so I, yeah, that's the reason, yeah, that's a, like, like a childhood memory, but yeah. Thanks, more questions? Do you have a favorite author, um, you know, that's a rise in um, Asian authors today? Um, you know, Rikachi and, and uh, you know, the Literary Festival have uh, quite a number of them, usually from Singapore and from Hong Kong. Do you have any favorite authors from Asia or, you know, from um, globally? And uh, is there a particular genre of the way they write that you particularly like? Um, I can answer the second question first, and anything um, about life, I would very much want to read. So um, there's no one particular genre. I read detective stories, um, I read uh, a lot of crime stories, and um, but not too bloody, as long as it, it's not too bloody, it's okay. And I read fantasy, and um, my favorite writer, I, I can't really um, give a name. I think it would not be fair to just give a name. There would be so many of them. And um, Asian writers, um, you mentioned all the names that I like. And I don't really, I think they would be so jealous if I, you know, name one person without naming another. <laughs> Um, but as I said, I read a lot, and um, I, and I think you're right. Um, there should be more platforms for Asian writers to showcase their work. And I think now the um, Hong Kong Literary Festival is doing a very good job at doing this, and I just hope that they will continue doing this. And um, but over the year, well, for example, in year 2011, I've been reading um, not just Le Misera, but um, like Ishiguro's um, a few novels of his, and, um, but they are not Asian. Uh, he's Asian, but he lives in the UK. And, um, and I also read a lot at that time of Margaret Atwood's book, and Agatha Christie, I am a big fan of hers. And um, and also, I was also reading Ernest Hemingway's um, Fiesta, The Sun Also Rises, uh, at that time, and um, Sarah Nagel, um, yeah, so. I tend to read a lot of translations. Um, that's what I like. Um, I think, in a way, the meaning is quite deep in the translations, and um, I, I must thank the translators for doing such an, an excellent job of keeping, you know, the message. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Okay, I think that we um, ha are about done. Perhaps Susanna might be able to linger a little bit more afterwards because now it's time for us to say thank you and wait. We have to also give show our gratitude in a substantive way. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so we have Wow. We have two. We have two different gifts. This is the first one. Wow. Is the How do you know I need <laughs> this? Yeah. Inspiration. Everybody needs it. It's yeah. the HKUST library Thank you. mug Thank you. with the spill-proof top, so you can yes. bring it anywhere in the yes. library. Yes. I like it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's let's let, okay. Let's do our photo scene over here, away from the photo. Okay. So let's. Okay, is this, is this better? Okay. All right. Okay, stand forward. Okay, here we go. Uh, one step forward. Yep, all right. So everyone can see. <laughs> okay. Okay, and wait, wait. Oh, one more. One more. Oh, one more. Okay. Wow. And then this is um, a gift of photographs from our latest nature ex um, nature photography exhibition that just came down recently. This is also still available if anybody else wants to. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay. So All right. Okay. Uh, one more. All right. 
Okay. All right, and thank, thank you, you all very much for coming. Thank you, Tori. Okay, and we hope that you enjoyed it. And um, pick up some snacks on your way out. And um, as I mentioned before, there's um, the books are for sale over there, and Susanna can linger and sign a few if you sure. want. Thanks again. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.